Hey guys, Chris here with The Good Old Gamer. So over the past couple of videos, I've been talking about new and emerging technologies coming out to innovate past the fact that graphics and CPU technologies are slowly coming to a halt. These technologies are running into the wall that is the end of Moore's Law. Now, what companies like AMD, Nvidia, and Intel are doing is they're trying to innovate their way out of that box, and Google's going ahead and going their route by trying a different way of things. Now, the PC gaming community was largely resistant to that due to the comment section on here, and that's fine. However, that market or that product is not being targeted towards that particular market. Same thing with the APU future video that I did. In this video, I was talking about how the mainstream user, the average users out there, will likely be able to get an APU in that two to three, maybe three to four hundred dollar range that will offer enough performance on both the CPU and GPU side to where discrete graphics cards and discrete products may not be necessary anymore for them. And that might be the case. We'll just have to wait and see. But these are things that these companies are looking into. Now, a shout out to Ava Langley for introducing me to this article. This is an article over here on Tom's Hardware, and this is a really, really interesting. Well, the most interesting part to me was the fact that this article came out the same day as my APU video and AMD starting to talk about 3D stacked RAM on processors. Okay, so of course I found that really, really interesting. But more interesting is hearing from AMD's senior vice president and GM Forrest Norod and what he had to say about certain things. Now, of course, AMD has been talking about going beyond Moore's Law for a while now, but they're looking at every possible way out there. They're looking at 2D, 3.5D, and 3D packaging. They're looking at any possible way to move past the limitations of current processing. One of the biggest things that he was talking about is frequently scaling and how that's stagnated. And in all honesty, he's actually seeing regressing speeds on certain products. And I think he's referring to the seven nanometer process. Jim actually did a video right over here. And in that video, he was talking about what if Ryzen doesn't hit five gigahertz or anywhere near it. And it looks like that may not be possible because moving down on smaller nodes is not yielding faster and faster CPUs anymore. NORAD also explains that node density improvements are also slowing. So basically, we're seeing limits around the 700 millimeter square mark, which is basically what we've known for a while now. So even going larger and larger isn't an option anymore. And you can see that this has been happening for a little while now. Taking a look at Intel's mainstream high-end CPUs over the past basically five years now, we're almost in Q2, so about five years, up till present, we can see what's actually going on. As you can see, the 4790K, that was on 22 nanometers, and then all of the rest of the CPUs are on 14 nanometers. Now, you can throw in all the pluses that you want, but it's still 14 nanometer technology. It's just refined as time went on. The biggest thing that we can see is going from 22 nanometers, we actually saw a major regression in CPU clock speed. And this is just what Forrest was talking about. He actually said that this is what he's seeing on newer processes moving forward as well. And it took Intel a while, all the way up until Kaby Lake, until it was able to beat the 22 nanometer process. So if we look at timeline on there, so it took about three years for Intel to actually outpace their 22 nanometer process. And if we look at this holistically, in that five year period where we're at, essentially we went from 4.4 to five gigahertz. So it took over five years to simply gain 600 megahertz. And this just isn't sustainable. This isn't going to entice people to keep on upgrading. Now, AMD's method has been, well, let's make it wider. Utilizing their Infinity Fabric technology and linking together different die, this has allowed them to outpace Intel on core count significantly and reduce cost overall. So this was great for AMD to get back into the game because people did need more than four cores and eight threads. Now, as a gamer, you can still use a four core, eight thread CPU today, and it's absolutely perfectly fine, especially a really high clock speed one like a 6700K, or even the 4790K that I just showed you. All of those are still perfectly fine. But for other tasks out there, six cores, 12 threads, or even eight cores and 16 threads makes a lot of sense. And with new consoles coming out, eight cores and 16 threads will become the new normal. It will replace the four core, eight thread CPU. So if you're looking to buy today, you want at least a platform that you can upgrade to an eight core, 16 thread CPU, because eventually you will need that. 
However, going beyond eight cores and 16 threads really doesn't make sense for the average consumer. Much like I was talking about in that APU video, this might not be for you, but for the average person, there is such thing as good enough, and the diminishing returns past that is simply not worth the cost increase. This is the reason why we don't see many people out there buying the i9-9900Ks at $500. Instead, the Ryzen 5 2600 with its six cores and 12 threads and lower clock speeds that is selling in much higher volume. So that brings me to Zen 2, with that supposedly going to have up to 16 cores and 32 threads on a mainstream desktop platform. How many people out there actually need or are going to be able to take advantage of that? I believe the answer to that is going to be very, very few. This is also the reason why I believe AMD is going to charge a large premium for that CPU. Now, the vast majority of people will be just fine with 8-core, 16-thread CPUs for the foreseeable future. So that's going to pretty much cover all of your gamers, anybody who does any basic productivity. Even if you do something like YouTube and video editing, 8-cores and 16-threads is more than enough to handle that. I'm using a 6-core, 12-thread CPU processor right now. That's enough. I've used a 4-core, four 4-thread four CPU while doing videos for this channel, and that worked just fine as well. Now, if you do a lot of handbrake encoding, that's definitely going to be helpful, and that's one of the reasons why I'm looking at it. Converting Blu-rays over, that's a very CPU-intensive task. So my point of bringing that up is there's just going to be a very niche market that are going to need anything past that 8-core, 16-thread count. So moving to, let's say, a higher core count than that, so like bringing 32 cores to the mainstream market makes literally no sense at all at this point in time and for the foreseeable future. It really just does not make sense. So more CPU cores isn't going to be helpful. Higher clock speeds isn't going to be attainable. What do you do? And this is one of the reasons why I'm really interested in the 3D stacking method, because there's a lot of different ways that this could go. And when I saw the Intel Fervoros CPUs and the fact that they're actually producing 3D stack chips at this point in time, that is super impressive because this means that they can add extra layers of cache if they wanted to as well. And if they could pull it off and make it all work, this means that they could shoot for much higher IPC than what we see here today by basically eliminating cache limitations by bumping that up. Now, how attainable is that? Well, that's what AMD and Intel are working on right now to figure out. But at the very least, that technology I can see making IPC so much higher that we can actually gain significant performance with lower clock speeds. For example, the Pentium 4 3.8 gigahertz gets demolished by a 2.4 gigahertz Core 2 Duo. IPC is more important than pure clock speed. It's more important than pretty much anything because a much lower clock speed CPU will produce less heat, it's more efficient, and cheaper to manufacture than a really, really large die with a ton of cores. So this is actually going to be something very interesting to see coming out in the next few years. Now we also see the same diminishing return on core count when looking at the RTX 2080 Ti and the RTX 2080. So for example, if we take a look at how many CUDA cores these uh, GPUs have, we have 2944 on the 2080 and 4352 on the 2080 Ti. So if we take 4352 and we divide by 2944, we can see that the 2080 Ti requires basically 48% more cores to go ahead and perform essentially 16% faster. That is a huge amount of die space necessary to go ahead and just get a little bit more performance. Now you might be saying the 2080 has a much higher clock speed than the 2080 Ti, and you would be correct but they need that lower clock speed to cram in all those cores. So that's another trade-off. You can have lower cores at higher speeds and that'll perform better, or you can have more cores at lower speeds and that only performs a little bit better. So that was the trade-off Nvidia decided to make here. And the performance gains are very, very minimal for that many more cores. 48% more cores, 16% more performance. So that's a clear indicator that they just can't make these chips bigger. That's not going to work. And if we're hitting clock speed limitations on the process nodes, that means they're not going to get too much faster than that 2 gigahertz mark that we've seen with Pascal. Maybe over time it'll get a little faster, but it's going to just trickle out. Much like what we saw with Intel. It's going to go down, and then it's going to trickle out, and it'll go up a little bit at a time. But it's going to take years and years and years to gain, what, 10% clock speed in five or six years? 
that's not going to really be that revolutionary. 10 years from now, if we see a 2.2 gigahertz GPU out there, is anybody really going to care? Even if it's 2.3 or 2.5? I mean, does that really matter? I mean, it, yeah, sure, it's going to be better, but that level of progression is going to be so much slower than what we've been used to. And that brings me to the point of this video. The point is that I know we like to complain things are slowing, they're not going to be... You know, we're not getting as much as we used to, and they're charging a lot more for this stuff. It costs these companies a lot more to build them, and obviously shareholders and all that out there. So things are costing more. We're getting smaller and smaller performance gains, and there's really not much that these guys can do with current technology. The only way to get around this is like what Forrest said. They need to be innovative, and they have to come up with new ways of doing things. That's why when I went ahead and did that video on Google Stadia, that's an innovative way to present gaming to average people. But to me, if they can overcome the limitations of such a process, you know, as latency and things like that, two of the biggest companies in the world are going to be going at this, as in Google and Microsoft. So if they can figure something out and make that work, that'd be really, really awesome. And that takes a lot of the onus off of us as consumers to have to purchase this really expensive hardware. Let these multi-billion dollar or trillion dollar companies out there, let them invest in that, and then that allows us to just play our games at top quality. Now, whether they can pull it off or not, as I said, we'll have to wait and see. And another interesting way to look at it was in that APU video. What if we don't get much faster? Let's say what we have out today is basically as fast as things are going to get. They'll incrementally get better as time goes on. Let's say that's it and things don't really get much faster. Let's say IPC is where it's going to be on both CPU and GPU. Okay, if that's the market and this is it, what's the next step? Well, the next step is to make things more efficient. And if you could cram as much of that as you can into a tiny little package, that'd be really, really awesome. Let's say you got 85% of the top tier performance today on an APU. That'd be really awesome. And I think the average person out there would be willing to sacrifice a little bit for that smaller profile or convenience factor. Not saying that any of that's going to happen or that's the way things are going to go, but that's the way things appear to be going right now. We hear this from AMD and Intel, and you can see it from NVIDIA. There's just no way to make things bigger and faster. That's just not working. The 2080 Ti compared to the 2080 is definitive evidence that things need to change, and the only way to move forward is through IPC gains and efficiency gains, and that's the, where the real battle is going to come in. Eventually, that's not going to matter anymore either because they're going to become so efficient, so small, and so cheap that, well, that won't matter either. And that ties me into the last little bit. I know a lot of people out there are going to be going, well, what about like ray tracing and this and that? Well, if graphics cards can't become exponentially faster, if they can't become exponentially bigger, well, that may never really come to fruition. Now, I'm sure over time, there's going to be somebody that figures it out, or they're going to come out with newer technology, like what we saw in the Crytek or CryEngine demo, where they can utilize regular rasterization to actually perform ray tracing, and in some combination with some dedicated ray tracing hardware, that may work out just well enough. Or potentially at 4K, ray tracing may have to stick with something like DLSS. And that might be one of the reasons why NVIDIA introduced that. I actually believe that is one of the reasons why DLSS exists, is because 4K by itself is hard enough to run even on a 2080 Ti. Certain games do not run well at 4K, even on a 2080 Ti. And if the next generation graphics cards aren't going to be much faster than a 2080 Ti, say 25% at best, because the 2080 Ti is only 25% faster than the 1080 Ti, and more than likely that's kind of best case scenario. And let's say even if that card can't run a game at 4K 60 or 4K 100 or whatever you want to play at, the only way to get you up to that graphical fidelity is by faking it with something like DLSS or dynamic resolution. And that's the reason why I think we see companies really looking at alternate solutions to deliver performance that people want, but within the constraints of the technological industry. Well, alrighty, guys, those are just my thoughts on the situation. It's uh, it's pretty interesting to see how much we've pretty much slammed into the wall at this point. I mean, we can keep adding cores and we can keep trying to make things bigger, but realistically, it's just not there. I mean, the 2080 Ti being only 16% faster and having 48% more cores, obviously, there's significant diminishing returns on that. And the same thing's going to happen with CPUs. Once we have 16 core mainstream CPUs, like I said, most people aren't going to need that. 
In all honesty, I don't even know if in 10 years we will need a 16 core mainstream CPU. So it's good to have for those people that need it, but realistically, most people are going to just go with eight cores, 16 threads at higher clock speeds or the highest clock speeds that they could get because that just simply makes the most sense and will deliver the performance that they want in the majority of programs out there in games and web browsing and all that stuff. Higher clock speeds is better than more cores. But I'm really curious to hear you guys' thoughts on this one. What, what do you guys think here? Uh, I mean, I thought we'd have a few more years. I know that we have more nodes coming out, but the fact that they're getting slower and slower as time goes on, we're losing clock speeds on smaller nodes. They're getting less and less dense, which means less transistors. Uh, I, I think we're really coming to the point where we need to see a major revolution in the industry or we need to see something, some sort of new technology out there um, that's why I'm pretty interested to see what they could do with 3D stacking, even if that means lower clock speeds, but much higher IPC. I'm okay with that. But let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. And if you like this video, please hit that like button. Please subscribe. Please share with friends. That really does help me out. That's all I have for today, and I will catch you guys in the next video.